This is a pilot instructor from the EJG-3, the 3rd Completion Squadron in Leckfield. Watching a machine as it flies by, he is able to give the pilot instructions from the ground of what to do and how to do it. This is a picture of the Messerschmitt ME-262 in the flight instructor's office. You can see how beautiful the machine is. She's a wonderful bird to fly. It is a single-seater, and the student pilot is alone in the machine. As you can tell by his cuff title, the flight instructor has served in Africa where he flew over 100 combat missions. The student pilot arrives. He is a sergeant, and apparently they are old acquaintances who flew together in Africa, because he too wears the Africa cuff title. They both have the Iron Cross First Class, which indicates they achieved at least three victories. The Iron Cross First Class has nothing to do with dedication or a number of missions flown, only with the victories. Out on the tarmac, the mechanic is polishing the nose of the engine. He gives it a final wipe down with his sleeve as he has no polishing rag. The student, then the instructor, both come out to look at the machine. The instructor shows him what needs to be done before he gets into the machine. The mechanic reports that the machine is in flying condition. As the instructor and student walk to the machine, the instructor gives him some advice which he thinks is important for the student to understand before they climb up into the machine. The mechanic takes the plate off from the front of the engine. and puts a screen on which prevents it from pulling rocks or pebbles into the turbine. The flight student sits in the machine, and the instructor shows him some of the instruments he finds in the cockpit. The instructor shows him on the right-hand side all of the electrical switches including the master switch and the flight controls on the left side. The two long levers are the throttles. On each throttle there is a little push button. Now he begins to explain the oil and fuel systems. These are the levers for the fuel tanks front and rear. In this position, both of them are switched to the rear tank so that the fuel is drawn from the rear tank to the jets. Here, they are switched to the front. Now, both jets are fed from the front tank. This is from the front and rear, one jet taking fuel from the rear and one from the front. One should fly the rear tank to half empty as soon as possible, in order to shift the center of gravity into the correct place. When the rear tank is full, the center of gravity is much further back than it should be.
Here, we have the instruments that show the turbine's revolutions. He continues to explain the throttles and tells him, as you will see later, that they are spring-loaded. Now, he orders the young mechanic to start the left engine. The little pull-start two-cycle motor on the front starts the turbine turning. Looking at the right-hand engine as it started, you can see how the little two-cycle motor brings this turbine up to speed. The right-hand gauge is now at 300 revolutions and slowly climbing. He must not use the throttle yet, and fuel cannot be injected right now. He then pushes the clutch to engage the turbine. When it has reached a specific number of evolutions, he pushes the throttle forward, and at 800 revolutions, he pushes the button, injecting fuel into the turbine. The fuel is distributed to the turbine's six combustion chambers. He pushes the throttle slowly ahead, keeping the button engaged. The instructor emphasizes how important it is to handle the throttles correctly to bring the turbines up to full speed. Now you can see how slowly he brings the throttle up. If you were to advance it any faster, he would have a blowout. The gauge shows how it comes up slowly. Once he is over 6,000 revolutions, he brings the throttle up faster to 8,700, grabs the top speed, and there it stays. The throttle can be overrun with higher revolutions for a period of 5 minutes, and then a combat situation even up to 10 minutes. He pulls the throttle back. It now shows 4,000 revs. Now he takes to the other side, keeping his thumb on the button to inject and ignite the fuel at the same time. Here are the temperature and pressure gauges. The temperature is very hot, as it always is in a jet. The instructor continues to show him what to do. He shows him different buttons and what they are for.
This one, for instance, is the flap control. The front button is flap down and the rear button is flap up. In the front of the flap controls, there are the undercarriage buttons. These are the main wheel brakes. Now, he pushes both of the throttles forward slowly. The revolutions remain the same on both sides. He begins a taxi test. This is the no- They watch another pilot student in the air, and the instructor tells his student that he is now ready to fly himself. The instructor gives him some more instructions. There is a lot to explain, and there's a lot for the student to take in, because the ME-262 is the world's first jet fighter. And since it is a single-seater, there will be nobody accompanying the students on his first flight. Now he shows him a machine coming in, and how the undercarriage comes down for landing. First, the main gear lowers, and after that the nose wheel. It is very important to make sure the undercarriage is locked. A green light in the cockpit shows that the undercarriage is down and locked. The nose wheel can be unlocked to permit ground steering using a Y-shaped yoke during towing. There's always something new, which the instructor brings across to the student. The student slowly absorbs it. They arrive at an undercarriage test. The undercarriage is brought in and out using outside power. Rather than using turbines to supply the power, they use outboard air and oil pressure. And there you can see that the wheel retracts and the flap closes behind it. For the undercarriage test, special stands are used to support the plane. The same stands will be used later to adjust the machine guns and cannons. The four cannons, Mark 108 30 millimeters, are adjusted at 800 meters. After basic flight training, the students will practice firing on ground targets. These two knobs are used when the undercarriage fails to come out. The oil cylinders are under great pressure, so when the knobs are opened, the oil pressure is released and the undercarriage will come down by itself. This happens frequently. 
During flight, the raising and lowering of the undercarriage is done hydraulically. The pressure is supplied by a pump located in the port engine. During the raising and lowering of the undercarriage, the nose wheel retracts and extends after the main wheels are locked into position. They now go down for the tower. The machine is landed. She lands on the main wheels first. The nose is still in the air. And as the speed bleeds off, the nose wheel slowly comes down to the ground. This demonstrates how the machines are pulled around on the field by a Captain Crop or track wheeled vehicle. The Ketten Prod is used for two reasons. First, it is a safe way to move the machines, and it also saves fuel. Now he has all his theory behind him, and he's ready to fly. The mechanic explains to him the last minute details that he needs to remember. And points out the electrical switches. All the switches are on the right hand side. In front is the main switch for the whole electrical system. Here, the mechanic points to the seat adjustment gear. This is the flight control center. The flight instructor is standing at the two-wheeled cart, which carries all the two-way radios. On top of the cart is the flight book, where all the flights are recorded. Clearance for takeoff is given by an attractive woman on the tarmac, who will wave a flag for clearance. Now, he's taxiing out of the starting point, and he stops there until he gets clearance from the flag girl. Of course, the instructor watches carefully. He talks to the pilot on the radio and gives him instruction on how to lift the machine off the ground. He reminds him of important procedures such as bringing up the undercarriage immediately after liftoff. The flag girl waves him off. As soon as he is off the ground, he pulls the undercarriage in. You can see inside the cockpit, button for the undercarriage which is marked EIN, which means IN. Before the wheels go up into the wheel wells, one must hit the brakes to stop them from spinning. The nose wheel comes up separately. It has its own brake lever. The instructor watches him and gives him some further guidance. 
He tells him to adjust the flaps and reach normal speed, and to bring both his throttles to 8,000 revs to prepare for some different maneuvers. Another student arrives and awaits his turn to fly the machine. He will use the same machine as it is already warmed up. Each machine may only fly for one hour, so the students fly one after the other. The instructor tells him to shut down the right turbine. You can see he pulls the throttle back, and the fuel switch is back already. Now he must trim the machine. He turns the trim wheel to trim the rudder, compensating for the shutdown turbine. This enables the machine to fly level. As the other student listens in, the instructor notes that the procedure has been done correctly, that the fuel was shut off before the throttle was brought back. The student pilot is pleased because he did it correctly. His speed gauge indicates that he has shut off the right turbine. Now he slowly turns it back on. Once again, he must push the button to ignite the fuel. Now, he can bring both throttles up again, so that the turbines have the same revolutions. Now, he shows what he can do with the machine. The student checks in with the instructor, and is told he may continue flying for a little longer. When he comes around again, the instructor tells him to reduce speed for landing. He has to push the flaps out to about 15 degrees. He reduces the speed to 240 kilometers, which is the approach speed. And he keeps it there until he is close to the ground. Now he drops the undercarriage. First, the main wheels, then the nose wheel. The instructor watches closely and gives him final instructions. Sometimes he has to bring the flaps down further in order to increase the resistance. Now you can see the nose wheel drop. The front push button is for the nose wheel, and the rear push button is for the main gear. He slowly comes back to the ground. 
the instructor tells him to hold the machine and push it a little forward to bring it in nice and straight. He just needs to hold it as it is, and the machine will land itself. She touches down gently. He doesn't brake immediately, but lets the machine run out nicely so as to not wear out the brake drums too quickly. Now, the nose wheel touches down. The instructor is pleased with the student's flight. The instructor switches his radio off and prepares to debrief the student pilot. It is now the other student's turn to fly. This is all the practical flight training the pilot will receive. There will be no more. First of all, there isn't enough fuel, and secondly, all the student pilots are aces who know how to fly. The only thing new to them are the turbines. The instructor congratulates the student on his first solo flight in the jet. One mechanic closes the front of the turbine so they are properly protected. The other mechanic on top of the wings says the student forgot to turn off the master switch again. He's laughing because this happens frequently. It's not a grave mistake, but the pilot has a higher rank, so of course, the mechanic has to have the last word as usual. He still wants to call out to him that he should shut off the switch next time. But they are already on their way to the instructor's office, where the student will receive further tips and more detailed instructions. Before the second flight, the instructor explains in greater detail the ignition and fuel systems of the machine. Such as the fuel and ignition starter, which is this button on the throttle. The instructor, once again, goes over the procedure of starting the machine. The little two-cycle motor starts the turbine and brings it up to about 800 revolutions. At about 800 revs, you start to inject the jet fuel. The fuel is made out of coal and is called J2. These are the clutch switches for the turbine similar to a car clutch. He pulls the clutch which switches over from the two-cycle motor and engages the turbine itself. He brings it up to 800 revolutions, and now he begins to play with the throttle. When he is over the 800 revs, he can go to 6,000 revs. And when he's at 6,000, he can go faster, up to 8,700 revs. He wants to make sure that he brings the fuel conch lever slowly, slowly forward.
This shows how the oil flows to the jets. There are extra filters to eliminate air bubbles out of the oil system. He now slowly advances the throttles. You can see here how the arresting springs are engaged, so one cannot pull the throttles back too quickly. This shows how the oil flows in the system to the different bearings throughout a battery of filters. This shows the fuel coming down and being ignited in the burn chambers of the turbine. Here, the turbine is at about 4,000 revs and gaining. Behind, we have a spring which is connected to the cone at the back. The spring moves the cone back and forth automatically at a speed of the turbine. You therefore have a steady flow of exhaust out past the cones. This is the cone. which is located at the end of the turbine's housing. To ensure an evenly steady thrust, it moves forward and backwards automatically. Now, it's time for a smoke and a bit of a break. The student has been given an enormous amount of information. Informally, of course, they still talk about the machine and discuss some of the specific challenges of jet flight that the fighter pilot has come to learn. He tells them how to equalize the machine if one engine fails. He can demonstrate it to him in practical terms. The instructor now uses a pen holder for his example. The two long pencils are the throttles. This is the fuel tank switch. Now he shuts off the right turbine. First, shut off the fuel, and then pull the throttle all the way back.
it's important to shut off the fuel first so that no fuel flows in without ignition. This is the trim wheel. It will compensate for the loss of the one engine. You straighten out by turning the trim wheel, which adjusts the side steering to compensate for the loss of the one turbine. He then brings the throttle back from top speed to ease the load on the remaining engine. In case of a blowout, the machine can fly quite well on one engine only and allows a pilot to fly back to his base safely. If the machine can start up again, engage the fuel tank and slowly bring the throttle ahead. Slowly, slowly. Until you are past the 6000 revolution mark. That is good but then you must straighten out again with the side steering using the trim wheel. Another student calls in. Flight instruction is finished for now. He is now a fully qualified jet pilot as he has finished his two jet flights. There are two units that have the Messerschmitt ME-262. They are the Galan Circus and JG-7. He will be assigned to JG-7. They finish the conversation and the instructor tells him to report to JG-7.